Morning, boys. Morning. What do you know? I'm going to. You should come back here. That always seems to work. All right, here it comes. Going home, better go with that for you. Cause we got a lot of living to do. Okay, well, let's do one more. We oh, got yeah, four, four clicks. Go to home, better go with that for you. Cause we got a lot of living to do. From the front again. Go to home, better go with that for you. Cause we got a lot of living to do. Okay. Here we go. Corner home, better go with them for you. Cause you got a lot of living to do. Cool, I think we've got it. Thanks. All right. Well, that was relatively easy. We were real close.
couldn't wait to play something like a Gypsy album. The harmonies, I'd have to say, was the number one uh, key ingredient, you know, that made that gypsy sound. These boys were the baddest motherfuckers. To Minneapolis up here when I was 12. I've always been able to sing. So I was very bashful about it. I had the ability when I was 12, 11, and 12 to hear a song on the radio and go down and play it, sit down and play it at the piano. I don't know. I don't read music. I never have. No theory or anything. By 1965 or so, it was estimated that there were anywhere from 350 to 500 bands in, uh, in Minnesota, but mostly clustered around the metro area, that were capable of doing a four-hour show. You could go to a teen dance basically any night of the week. You could break out of here. You could go national. It is po possible for a, a talented local band to make the kind of record that could end up on the national charts. Well, that was a wonderful time in music, you know. Uh, nobody was pigeonholed into a certain type of music. Everybody was doing their own thing. We were not aware that Gypsy had already been together under another name for three or four years. And we needed a bass player, so we made Donnie Larson play bass. <laughs> he was in the neighborhood. We made him play bass. They looked at me uh, one day and they said, hey, you want to learn how to play bass? I said, sure, let's go. They didn't even know what it really was, really. Pointed at the biggest bass they had on the wall, that's the one you want to buy, because Little Richard's bass player played it. And pretty soon we was a band. We started playing bass basements, you know, around the neighborhood. We were known as hard guys. We, we, we didn't take crap off nobody. And a band like uh, the Underbeats or the Accents or Gregory D and the Avantis, which were considered the big three in the Twin Cities back in about 63, 64 in that era, um, they were playing seven nights a week. The crisscrossing of the cities and, and the, the, uh, the busyness of the bands was just, uh, it, it was unbelievable back in, uh, by 65 or so. The Stones, we, they don't like us because we were at the prom ballroom and they were out at uh, Danceland. Probably the worst gig they ever did. They had 17 people there that night. <laughs> I said, what's going on? Oh, there's a battle of the bands or something going on with the underbeats, the accents, and the Avantes. We might have outdrew them. Oh yeah, there was like 1,700 people in and out of the prom that night. Well, we outdo Peter, Paul, and Mary. Said, Where is everybody? We're out seeing the underbeats. <laughs> The crowd, everybody out front was underage and they were drunk. I mean, they were loaded, greased to the nines. And things started getting heating up and my girlfriend was out in the audience and this guy got into an argument with her. She probably clocked him because he was getting out of hand. And she came up on stage, he came up after her, and I took my, I had a, that's why I like Fender basses. I clocked that guy and knocked him right off the stage. And he was flopping out front and he got up, whatever. Next thing you know, a whiskey bottle comes flying up on the stage and smashes against the black back wall. And it's like, oh God, we're not ever coming to Wisconsin again. Well, the next week we were in Wisconsin. And that guy came up because his girlfriend was looking at Johnson, bap, hit the microphone into his, down with the guitar, threw it on the floor. I told Rico and Tom, do not stop playing. Whatever you do, do not stop playing. Moses part in the sea, you watch Johnson go to there. And that guy's legs went straight up. Straight up in the air, came back down. He came back up, we finished Johnny Be Good, and that was it. Well, they came back later with three carloads full of their buddies. And we had to stand out there while our roadies loaded up, Johnson with his Ned Buntline 45, me with my Army 45. They followed us all the way back to the St. Paul. And every time they used to come around the side of the bus, the, the van, one of us would stick a gun out there, and they'd hit the brakes and back off, you know. 
When they brought Enrico in, um, it, it just completely changed the dynamic. He was a fantastic singer. He was a great looking guy, uh, uh, excellent guitar player. He just, uh, he put that whole thing over the top. And it didn't take long for Jim Johnson to realize that here was a talent that, uh, uh, that could make my band even better. And at this point, Jim Johnson was not going to settle for being just uh, the big three in the Twin Cities. He already had his goal. He was going to take the underbeat someplace national, but he needed a better band. And so when he saw Rico playing with the Escapades, he said, I gotta get that guy. You broke my heart and I don't think I can go on. So I gotta get this guy my band. <laughs> Uh, Jim Johnson figured, if I can get Rico and if I can get Tom Nystrom, I'll have the dream band that's going to be good enough, you know, for me and Donnie to uh, to take it to the next level. And he heard him with the Escapades, and he knew the guy could sing, and he got to know him, and the guy could play two-string rhythm. Rico, you got to join my band. You got to quit these guys. So that happened. He had a really good voice. So I raped every band in the city, pretty much. I took Rico and I took Tommy, and that was me, Rico, Donnie Larson, the four of us. We had three lead singers, me and Tom and Rico, and we kicked real booty. It was just, I just, what a band. That was bad. And it got to the point where I turned down almost as many jobs as I took. Pack them every, every place we played. So we were doing nine gigs a week, and the money just kept pouring in. And this rock and roll band from Minneapolis was going to be the biggest rock band in the world. Nineteen sixty six is when I got my draft notice. Uh, and I was already twenty three years old. And uh, right away I had a guitar sent there. And then Jim gets drafted, and so what's he going to do? That's uh, two years out of his life, right at the, this is 1966, right in the absolute heart of the rock and roll era, when, uh, uh, when the playing is at its peak, songwriting is at its peak, everything is just sort of all coming together to make a rock and roll, not just a cultural phenomenon, but, but uh, it, it, was a, um, it, was, it was art. So I got my draft card. And that pretty much uh, stubbed my career. He got drafted, and I, my brother and I both talked to him and said that, hey, look, you're an only surviving son. You don't have to go. You can get out of it. And he's a real patriotic guy. He said, no, I got to go. I was, I was a good shot. I, I was gung-ho. You know, I was very competitive in, in, in anything I've ever done. I've been competitive. And I figured, well, I'm in a fucking war. Might as well fight a war, you know. But I've been, I've seen some bad stuff that, you know, I don't want to really get into that. So what Jim decided to do was uh, bring in a couple of players to replace him while he was in Vietnam. He br brings in Jim Owl Walsh from uh, the Hot Half Dozen. Great keyboard player, great singer. And I uh, was luckily picked up by them and we hired another guitar player and the, the whole plan was a two year wait for him to come back and then we were going to leave for California. And he brings in uh, Wally Wallstead. We knew uh, who Wally was. He'd come up and play guitar, you know, uh, after we got done, because Johnson always had nice guitars. So we would look at each other, it's just like, wow, this cat can really play. So I cut a deal with him, I said, look, I'll give you two years, full two years with this band, and your career should be taken off by them because you'll get your name known. You're never going to get your name known coming from Wilmer. So he said, okay, that was it. We introduced him at the Kaufman Union one night, and we were playing a song. Shake It For Me by Howlin' Wolf. I said, I'll tell you when to solo, okay? Okay, you know, and so I said, now, and he ripped off a solo, and I said, keep going. And when he got done, the audience gave him a standing ovation, and they were still clapping at the end of the song. I said, Wally, that's for you. Oh, God, oh, he's so bashful. I said, oh, no, he just didn't want to. I eventually uh, played some dates with the Underbeats, and they were doing some recording, and I got to know those guys and went and played keyboards for them on some recordings, and that's how the whole thing kind of turned. And, and Nystrom and Rico wanted uh, Walsh in the band because he had that really high voice. So there we went, they built on, they were always building around the vocals. 
So I'd always been the leader of the band, okay? Chose the song, pointed out, well, you play this, you play this, you play that. So I had to pick someone to take my place in the interview. So I was going to be gone two years. And I had met Walsh, Jim Walsh, keyboard player, hell of a singer. He's a good musician. Walsh is a very good musician. And he learned everything really well, really well. So um, it just took off. It was probably a, one of the easier transitions. What is crazy about keyboards, like I said, they, they, they kind of gave me a headache. And my mother was a singer, so, and this beating on the drums and playing the piano had been something I'd been doing the whole time since I was five, so. Jim spent two years in the Army, and then when he got back to the Twin Cities, he told Wally, you know, I, I told you when I hired you, it was only going to be a two-year job. You are going to be a placeholder, but it was going to get you your start, and you could go on to do lots of other things. Then when I came home, right back into the band, the, the problem with that was I kind of lost my leadership, you know, part of, part, of, part of my soul. I was just happy to be alive. He was changed when he came back, too. The Underbeats were still Jim's band when he got back, but uh, the Vietnam experience had a really profound effect on him. Jim really felt like he'd kind of lost his, his leadership uh, qualities while he was in Vietnam, but it's understandable. And, and in that vacuum, of course, Rico stepped up because he was uh, by far the most uh, talented songwriter of the group. He was, he was just uh, pumping out material. Uh, and Jim Walsh was also a, a good, a uh, good songwriter and uh, excellent arranger. So between the two of them, they had really started to craft the direction of the music. It's gonna rain today because of you. The sky looks gray today. And, and Jim fit back in again, vocally and uh, guitar-wise. Um, and also, uh, he loved the music that they were making. I mean, he was Rico's biggest supporter. He had put together a great band, he knew it, he fit in uh, perfectly to it, and uh, he was willing to, to let Rico and, and Jim have a little bit more sway. By 1966 or so, in the Twin Cities, uh, into 67, uh, the, the dynamics were changing a lot. Minneapolis was just not not the place to try to get a national hit. Nobody was going anywhere. And even locally, you couldn't get your records on uh, local radio anymore. So what's a band like the Underbeat supposed to do? They're, they're recording these fantastic songs, Footsteps, and uh, It's Gonna Rain Today. Um, it, it, they're, they're sounding as good as anything that's on the radio, but they can't get airplay here. So at this point, they realized that um, there's just no way you can stay around here if you've got ambitions to do any more than to continue to play that five-state uh, ballroom circuit. I took a look at the underbeats and I said, my God, these guys are so much better. Let's take them out to Hollywood and get them out of Minneapolis where Amos Heilecker and Ira Heilecker control things and, and weren't really giving anybody a, a break. We knew nothing was going to happen from here. There was no chance in here. And we had a specific plan. It was amazing. And at that time, the recording industry was really based in, in Los Angeles, there was no doubt about it. So when I came back from the Army and back into the band, I mean, I, I, t I told the guys, well, first of all, I'm not going to be playing in Minneapolis. I'm going to Los Angeles. If y'all want to go to Los Angeles, let's go. Baby, there's no need for us. We bought an old school bus. Uh, I think. I'm trying to remember, I think we paid $600 to $800 for it, but it was a good strong bus and we packed all their gear up in there. Flagstaff, Arizona, Walsh is driving, and the cops stop us. We're dri we got a, a bright orange school bus, which is illegal. And we got all long-haired hippies down here, and they stopped and they said, what do you got, any contraband? Nah, we got nothing. Cop opens the glove box on the 38, <laughs> hits the floor. And I think there might have been a bag of weed, I'm not sure about that. So they haul him off to jail and tell us we can't move that bus in front of that police station. Okay, so they gave us a ride down to the, gro down to the hardware store and we got red, white, and blue paint and started painting it. And I got out of the service September 68 and we were in Los Angeles by Thanksgiving. 
that was an adventure getting there because it, as we got into Colorado and stuff, there were many stations said uh, no hippies allowed, no long hairs allowed. You know, the United States was kind of torn between uh, anti and pro-war in those days, and uh, so there were problems. I had the shortest hair of anybody in the world. <laughs> When I was 19, to get in that bus, we had no money. All we had was this vision. That's all we had. Little did we know driving that in L.A. is a bust me flame with the cops. Like dummies, we're driving that bus down Sunset Strip. It's a bust me to the cops. Hey, look at here, bust us. You know, that kind of thing. And him and I were sleeping on the bus one night. We didn't have no place to go. And he just happened to be sleeping next to the window. And a cop comes up on the outside with his nightstick. Bonk, bonk, bonk on his head. Hey, dirty hippie, get up. Same thing, just knocked him on the head until you guys, after a while, we figured that we couldn't, we couldn't drive it into Hollywood anymore. The cops in LA, I hope I never have to go back, were just, they're cowboys. And that bus was just a piece of crap. 55 miles an hour and it was, the motor was screaming so hard, you couldn't hear. We did a gig out at the airport with the strippers and uh, one of them took me home, that's another story. <laughs> we had nothing, we had no money. We used to eat a box of rice and a ring of bologna every night when we got there for months and months trying to, you know, break the spell and get into some place and play. So we'd play for free if we could, you know. Within a short time though, we ended up at Gazzari's. Light My Fire started getting airtime on the radio and I knew that the doors had been at Gazzari's so I immediately drove down to Gazzari's and talked to Bill about applying for the houseman job there. The thing is, if you played Gazzari's, you were on your way. You were there from maybe seven in the evening until one in the morning, but you played two times. There were three bands, so you played twice. That band was so good. Uh, getting the audition was, was my job. Once I did that, we, we generally got the job. We could not believe that he got us on the Sunset Strip that fast. Because Ari's was sort of like all up and coming groups who uh, would accept the lower pay. You could get your start there. That was the place to get into. That seemed to be the door opener up on the Sunset Strip. Everybody had played there. The doors, uh, the birds. And we were hard working boys. So, you know, uh, Gypsy always was. We rehearsed more than anybody. That's why Gypsy became what it was. We rehearsed a lot. And I'd never been in a band that had that kind of a diligent rehearsal schedule where everybody on the band was very serious about doing this, this venture. I insisted on constant rehearsal. Good enough isn't good enough. You want to make it, you got to be fucking fantastic. And you got to work at it. That's how you get noticed. We had gotten some uh, write-ups in the LA Times from a guy named Ernest Feather, and he always loved the band. He loved the vocals, he loved the, the band itself, but he said the name was outdated. So we smoked our way into a new name one night. <laughs> We were sitting around uh, up at the uh, hill on the house that they had in Silver Lake. Bombed on her ass, and I just said, why not Gypsy? I don't think that's been used yet. And pretty soon everybody just said, that's it. It was perfect. Yep. Donnie, Donnie said it, and we knew that was it. I remember we got it down to two names. Spare Change was one of them, and the other one was Gypsy. The underbeats just felt it felt uh, kind of like uh, it was uh, from an, a little different era. We wanted something uh, a, a little more all-encompassing, some, something that at least had some kind of larger connection with uh, a, more of a modern era. There's many examples of groups that were called something like the Underbeats in 1965, turning into uh, super magic uh, fudge you know, by 1968. The Beach Boys, in fact, almost changed their name from the Beach Boys, which was sort of sound old-fashioned, 
at this point and just call themselves Beach. Then after we renamed the band Gypsy, you know, uh, that was, that was the, the, the point where we started doing, you know, good business. After those nine months, they weren't the underbeats anymore. They were now definitely Gypsy. Everybody in town was pretty much freaked. It was, it was strange. Little did we know anything was going on. I mean, everybody was scared, man. We didn't know what the hell, if somebody going to come to our door and, you know, sort of, you know, pull some shit on us. It was like an explosion that was ready to go off. Yeah, you didn't know who it was, who they were going to go after. Everybody was suspect. The Mansons uh, came and killed the neighbors that lived directly behind our home. And little did we know, uh, it was uh, the one of the Manson family murders that occurred at the LaBianca house. Our neighbors... The LaBiancas live right behind you and they were murdered last night. Oh, what? We were awakened by the uh, feds came in and I was in my bed uh, naked with an American flag as my uh, bedspread and he said, okay, hippie, get out of bed. We were totally suspect, you know, a house full of hippies. The next morning, the FBI stormed our house, homicide people, and put everybody in a different room of the house and they questioned us all. They just wanted to know if we heard anything last night or if we saw anything. And it didn't take them too long to understand we're a bunch of farmers from Minneapolis, <laughs> not, not a bunch of killers. So they went through our house, they went through our backyard, found our pot field and kind of laughed that off because it was so small. And get rid of those pot plants in, the, in your backyard before I call the DEA on you. So the minute they left, I went outside and started ripping up all my pot plants that I had planted. They pulled up some plants that they had and back and whatever else, blah, blah, blah. A little garden growing back. A nice little garden. They were at our house for a couple of weeks. The whole neighborhood, I shouldn't say just our house, but the whole neighborhood, anything close, they were looking for clues. Fortunately, we had played that night, so our alibi was dead. They made sure we, we were where we said we were, but we were there, plenty of witnesses, you know, two, three hundred people seeing us. So. You could tell immediately that it changed the world. Man, after that, just this dark cloud came over, and hippies were just, you were scum. Every, that's when it really started getting tight on, on hippies. No more hitchhiking, no more picking up anybody, no more, no more free love. It wasn't a good time. It was a horrible situation there. Yeah, that's the same house. Double bungalow. The LaBiancas lived just on the other side, up on top. This is uh, overlooking Burbank here in Los Feliz, right off Los Feliz Boulevard. Rico and Jay were upstairs. And they came right in and cleared the house. They ran through this house and that house like crazy for two weeks. FBI asked everybody what we were doing the night before. Half of us couldn't remember. And they never told us. We found out later you know, why we were there, you know, a couple days later. Songwriting was done here. A lot of chicks were done here. A lot of great parties were done here. A lot of acid was done here. We used to, we, the record was 14 straight hours of uh, Monopoly. We sat right in that window there at a round table and played Monopoly for 14 hours. Elmer Valentine came up and saw us from the whiskey, which was down, two blocks down knew of us and then uh, CTA Chicago their album took off and we were friends with those guys we'd been staying with them a little bit and stuff so they suggested that Elmer let us come down there and that was a huge break for us and made the switch from Gazaris to the Whiskey A Go Go. Things really started to take off uh, particularly after we uh, got became the house band at the Whiskey. Chicago 
had left the house, had left uh, the uh, whiskey as a house band, and we kind of took over at, at, as a house band. And every time they needed someone to come play, they'd call us up, and we could be down there and set up and ready to go within an hour and a half, two hours at the most. The big hook down there was they fed us. So every night at five o'clock, we'd roll that bus in there and we'd start eating until they kicked us out of the kitchen and then we'd wait and play that night. If you were playing house band Whiskey Go-Go in 1969, your headliners are gonna be Led Zeppelin, the Mothers of Invention, the early Alice Cooper band. Um, many greats passed through there. The opening groups would really be you know, playing with people who were at the top of their game. A house band at the Whiskey pretty much had to earn its chops to get to that seat. If you were a house band at the Whiskey during the late 1960s, you're getting a shot at being noticed. And this is something that becomes a legend, you know, as far as you come to Hollywood and you get noticed. But in those days, Whiskey Go Go did mean that you had earned your place and were probably hot enough to be selling records. You know, and you might have some good material or you are a band that really kicks ass, you know, and then people would probably buy, and buy your records for that reason, you know, they're a hot rock, you know, cook band or jams or, or has good songs, you know. Whiskey Go-Go's most well-known house bands would be The Doors, The Buffalo Springfield, and Captain Beefheart and his magic band. And we did a couple of things with Little Richard there when he was big, and then when King Crimson came over for the first time, they rolled about two trucks worth of equipment in there and they played at night. It was the loudest thing I ever heard. Oh God, it was, it was awesome. We got to play with everybody. We had our full head pictures. There's five placards in front of the Whiskey Go-Go. Had all of our pictures, huge head shots. My head is like six feet, you know, six feet by four feet, our heads, gypsy. I couldn't believe that, that, they, that, that they'd done that. And Rico, that pecker. <laughs> I mean, he went up there one day and had them put on the on the marquee. Gypsy featuring Enrico. And they took pictures of it, then took it down. I seen the picture, I go, what? He said, oh, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. It was just for a few hours. They had it up to you prick. But that was the place to be, you know. It was everybody in music would show up there by one or two in the morning, always full of stars at night. It was just amazing. Being in Hollywood at the in '69 and '70 was uh, was just a, a very glorious adventure. Every day was uh, was uh, like a, a chapter in a book. Okay, now the crowds to Whiskey Go Go is an interesting thing. Every night it was a bizarre world. It was fabulous. Clubs going on and people walking for miles. We used to open up these huge bay windows on uh, the dressing room up at the Whiskey, and there were people, it went for miles, shoulder to shoulder. But if you'd be standing there, there'd be guys going, downers, uppers, uppers, downers, acid, <laughs> uppers, downers, acid, if you want to, you know. And it got to the point where it was known all over the world that way. Here I am, 40 years later, back at the Whiskey, these streets used to be full of people every night, full of people, both sides of the street. Titty bar is gone, that's a disappointment. Stage door, opening act, dressing room, main act was on the corner. This is where we had all of our pictures, life-size pictures all the way around the corner. A lot of great memories here, this place was awesome. This is where we partied with Hendrix, and he came to our show. Yeah, it was all, him and Buddy Miles. So I'm still tuning the guitar, and all of a sudden the door opens, and she pushes Jimi Hendrix in. This is, this is his girlfriend at that time. She pushes him in the room. Hi, Jimmy. Hi, you know, how are you? My name is Jimmy, too. How are you doing? We met, and he sat down, and he noticed the combat infantry badge that I had on the, the headstock of that, of that guitar, that Gibson. So we got to talk, and, he, and he's a, a veteran. Nicest fucking guy, I couldn't believe what a nice guy he was. And he picked up the guitar and he played it a little bit. We said, you know, I can't play because I got to play him upside down, kind of, you know. I said, Wah. He came there to apologize for using the name Band of Gypsies. 
is it okay, you know, that we, Jim's going, yeah, sure. You know? <laughs> Here's an icon like Jimi Hendrix, and he's asking us forgiveness for using that name. Oops, I touched the mic. And I, I said, Jim, I said, Jesus Christ, you probably sold us 25,000 albums just by, you know, putting Gypsy on, you know, on your album there. Pretty soon the word got out that Jimmy was upstairs and that room got so crowded you couldn't move after a while. And then we had to go out and play. But he was a swell guy. We'd show up at about five. They would feed us every night. Uh, we would do an early show and then the headliner would come on and then we would do a late show. When we got here, we knew we had crossed the threshold. We knew. And then that's when we got better. We changed the name. We got the song right and going. And everything changed then. You know, in your mind it changed too. I was only 19, 20, you know. So I was spinning, you know. Yeah, it was awesome. Everything you could want. Food, chicks, music. Rico and I were down on Hollywood Boulevard shopping. I happened to see uh, this Mucha print. I bought it and uh, I gave it to uh, Julio Aiello, who was my contact with Metro Media Records and told him that's, I wanted that to be the album cover. Well, Metro Media was a, was a major label and you know, they let us do the thing, so we did it. But after, you know, the, as soon as the album was released, then we got started getting bookings around the United States, so we had to leave the whiskey. We eventually released the record and decided we shouldn't play there anymore. Ahmed Erdogan from Atlantic Records, someone had told him, you should go see these guys. He came down and saw us. And then Tommy and Artie Volando from Metro Medial Records, who had uh, Bobby Sherman, was huge on TV and on the radio. Bobby Sherman? Oh, <laughs> They came down and saw us, and they made us an offer, and Ahmed Erdogan made us an offer. This is the great sound of Gypsy on Metro Media Records. There's a lot we could tell you about this album, but we'll let the album speak for itself. It's the great sound of Gypsy, but wait, 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 wait. there's a soft side to Gypsy, too. Warning. A mellow, quiet, moody sound. In all moods, Gypsy comes across and comes across strong. Gypsy on Metro Media Records. Gypsy. A double LP on Metro Media. It's surprising, really, that uh, Metro Media was able to even cr help them create a record that good. Uh, they got them into a good studio. Uh, the production w w was first class. The sound of it was huge. So, uh, by the grace of God, they let us do it. We spent $43,000 in 1970, which is what now? You know, that was unheard of. They thought we were crazy. The first album, which was a pretty much unheard of, it was a double album. And you know, not too many other people, I think Chicago is one of the only other people that had a double album at that time. The first album is a really incredible collection and collaboration of three people. Of course, Rico Rosenbaum, who was kind of the principal writer, and Jim Johnson and I, who lengthened and added all these uh, long, you know, some of these songs are 11 minutes long. So those two guys would take unfinished songs of Rico's and work them up. Like the sun at sunset Filling the sky I can sum it up in, in four letters, K-S-H-E. Casey Radio, uh, in its formative years, w allowed the disc jockeys to find music. We were able to 
uh, bring an album in on a, a, a social level and say, hey, guys, listen to this. So Gypsy became a, a, a in-house hit with all the disc jockeys at Casey very quickly because it spoke to the very core of what Casey Radio was about. We were all very excited about this new renaissance of music, new musicians who weren't afraid to try things. So we gravitated to the jazzy, progressive rock style of musicians who would experiment with music and Gypsy did that very well. It takes you on a musical ride and a lot of like different moods, like rock to soft rock to almost classical to jazz. I mean, it just all blended together so well. I, that album's a work of art. It's a, uh, that's one incredible group of talented musicians and songwriters. You take side four of their first double LP, oh my gosh. The, 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 those, there were only two songs on side four, right? So you could put on an 11-minute song and then kick back and actually hear more of it. If you played a shorter song on the radio, you had less time to prepare for the next song and the next thing you're doing, so you didn't hear as much of it. So that gave Gypsy an advantage. So I, I, that's why I played it at first, but then I played it because I really liked it. And that's why it got a lot of airplay on Casey, because the DJs themselves liked it, and they had that opportunity, that option to play what they liked. If there were more major markets out there that uh, uh, were listener-oriented like Casey, I think, I, think, I think Gypsy might have gone a little bit further than they did. Not only were they really good live, but when it, when it came time to record and the, the sound of it and the, the technique and, and the musicianship it took to do what they were doing, it just blew my fucking mind, right? People forget that those songs were recorded in their entirety. It's not like digital world. Some of that shit is so funky. Julio. There you are, man. Oh, God. 45 years. Oh, oh, Jesus. Oh. Incredible. Huh? Incredible. This guy made all the big decisions. He's the reason we got a deal, right? This is the original. Yeah. It's never been opened. This oh, is 45 years old. That's, That's the original. Incredible. And this is the single. Go to the booth. And still he had a hard time singing. I said, well, get your guitar. And when he got his guitar in the vocal booth, he was able to sing because that was comfortable to him. It was at the point where the record was finished and ready for distribution that Metro Media's inexperience showed through. Um, they had this, this fantastic product to sell, but they didn't know how to sell it. Metro Media missed its opportunity with, with, that, with that album to produce a number one uh, single. I really think in those days of payola, um, you had to have the DJs behind you and sometimes it just took a lot of uh, money to get songs played on the radio and if we had got more airplay, I think Gypsy probably would have broke, um, broke it wide open and crossed over. When it came to Gypsy, they just felt like a thud because Metro Media didn't have the experience uh, and didn't really put the effort into establishing their career the way they should have. Unfortunately, we made the wrong choice. We, we went with Metro Media instead of Atlantic, thinking we were going to be, uh, get better treatment because Atlantic had a huge roster. We didn't. As it turned out, they didn't know what to do. So it became, uh, uh, we were educating them on what to do. Nobody knew how to promote it, okay? And we got no feedback whatsoever. We got nothing from the record label. It was the difference between Atlantic and Metro Media. You know, I don't think Metro Media followed up with enough promotional monies and dollars to really push that album as hard as it should have been pushed. And they fought everything we wanted to see they fought. You know, had they signed with Atlantic, it, I mean, come on, man. 
The producers they have there, the two or three guys, they're geniuses. I, at the time, there were tons of rumors like that too, but I never denied them because I wanted other record companies to think they better hurry up and sign the group before Atlantic did. So I purposely kept those rumors going or didn't, sure didn't discourage them. And not going with Atlantic probably, in addition to really hurting their record sales and their prestige, uh, probably was the decision that started the unraveling of the band. Gypsy, uh, 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 playing on that band is, uh, uh, there's a lot of parts players that can do that music really well, that can play the part really well. And uh, uh, I don't think it was in my artistic makeup to be doing that. And, and God bless him, I, I, I love the guys. Uh, but uh, I'm more of a more of an improvisational guy. Jay was a. a I'm not taking anything away from the guy. Cause he's very talented, but he was a little too jazzy for Gypsy. And there was one song on, on uh, uh, the first album, Dead and Gone. And it's very simple. It's almost country. Jay had a real problem with it because he's like, you know what I mean? Excellent drummer. But he had a problem pulling back just to play a normal song. You know, I come from a, a jazz uh, background and still and have played jazz all my life. And uh, there, uh, in that genre, there, there's a very strong emphasis on. Um, on not playing the same kinds of things night after night. The, the, the initial thing. Came back to Minneapolis, we saw Bill Lord. That's the guy, no doubt about it. They were looking to make a change with the writing they were doing, and my style was more suited uh, for the direction they were going. Donnie Larson never agreed with the Metro Media idea. He always thought Atlantic was the better, uh, the better step to take. And, and then he started having disagreements on a more personal level with some of the guys in the band. He and Rico uh, got into a fist fight on stage one night. Challenged me one too many times. He forgot us from the north side. No hard feelings though. And he didn't stay with the band a whole lot longer after that. At a recording session to redo some stuff on the second album, I just Engineer said something to me, I put my bass in my case, stood up and said, see it, I'm gone. And I did. And I had no problems with the guys in the band. They had no problems with me quitting. You know, it was either quit or get fired. So they figured, well, we gotta cut Donnie loose. I think Donnie's my best friend. I was just said, uh, I don't want nothing more to do with Hollywood. That's it, I gotta get out of here. I got two kids to raise. And it was fun while it lasted, but I mean, you gotta, you gotta make a living. And everybody out there is, sleeping on somebody's couch and, you know, just living day to day. I can't do that. My name is Randy Cates. I was the bass player for Gypsy uh, for the last, the third and the fourth album. I spent hours and days and weeks and learning all the stuff that had already been recorded and then from there I started working on the originals that they were writing at the time. We uh, were signed by a company called Heller Fischel Agency, Jerry Heller, um, and they were booking uh, the Guess Who. So. Uh, they started putting us on some Guess Who dates in California. We went up to San Francisco and played at Winterland with them one night with Mason Prophet, Gypsy, Guess Who, and the Chambers Brothers. Every place looks the, same. the Guess Who Corporation bought our band. 
and they became our managers. So we traveled with them for two and a half years. In search of a We played every major city, every secondary city, every major college in the United States, went across Canada twice. Because of the lack of highways up there, they would lease a plane. And uh, so every night we would play in a different city and every night we would be in someone's room. We'd sit and smoke hash and weed with the pilots of the plane every night. So in the morning, they wouldn't drink, but every morning when we got up, we walked out, got on that plane, and they were the last two guys to crawl up the stairways and hear the engines going, knowing that three hours earlier we were passing the pipe to these guys, you know. They must have had a ball, you know. I was scared shitless. And most of the time we played in uh, hockey rinks that were, uh, they put plywood down on the ice and set the stage in the seating on that in uh, our dressing rooms would be the hockey players and we'd freeze our ass off up there. We played a bar in uh, Minot, North Dakota and it was really my, f my first time of being uh, cold. But it was 70 degrees below zero and people were just going like everyday occurrence where if it was in Texas we'd, uh, there wouldn't be anybody on the streets in the bars, they'd all be home. and saying it's cold, but they just were there partying just like it was 60 degrees outside. And it turned out we were pretty much ended up being like a tax write-off for that man. We couldn't see through the rose-colored glasses and realize that our career was dying on the vine. Nothing else was happening. That was the trouble. It was kind of a strange period. We just got tired of being chumped. And that's kind of what broke the band up. Things just kind of fell apart. Rico kind of got distance from the from the band. He ran into some other people, and some other, you know other stuff. You know, me and Walsh had you know put things back together in Minneapolis and trying to keep Gypsy going. Thank you. We are glad to be back. It's been a long time. Damn if we didn't play the big Bush Stadium. I had no idea that it was going to be that big of a show. They were expecting 40, 50,000 people. We went out there to play that show. We had no idea. People had banners. The people were hanging around the hotel and people were in tears. <laughs> We played that uh, uh, Super Jam in St. Louis. That was 77. And that uh, was me and Rico, Randy, Stanley, and, and a kid named, oh, good to have it in there. Barry Kay played keyboards. And Rico had seen me play and said, hey man, I want you to play keyboards on at this gig in St. Louis, and I was like, man, I'd be honored. Well, I'm myself, I really if I... And it was at Bush Stadium. They were expecting 40, 50,000 people. And he said, James is unavailable. I couldn't leave the state. They wouldn't let me go. They just, I tried and tried, but they wouldn't let me go. It turns out that, you know, he was in a little bit of trouble and was unavailable to do the gig. Knocked on the door, and it wasn't a, 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 the kind of a police knock, it was a knock, so I went and answered it, and he put a gun on my head and said, back up, fatso, and back me up to the refrigerator, and I told him there were children in the house and there were no guns, so he kind of mellowed out. And so they searched the house and found a bunch of shit. Marijuana, three pounds. 48 grams of cocaine, two scales, 
two pounds of cutting material, uh, written ledger. There's a good one. You always write it down. So yeah, it was all stupid. You know, I was just trying to maintain a lifestyle that I was used to in Los Angeles. While he was holding the gun on me, he said, uh, I was undercover at the Steppenwolf concert, and you guys were unbelievable. I said, thanks. And then I went to jail for the rest of that day, so. And I'm really sorry, James, that you missed that gig. But brother, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to uh, step into your shoes for that gig. It's okay. I understand that they got a, a good guy to fill in for me, and they went and did it. It was like be the Beatles for a day. That's, that's what it was like. It wasn't the same. I've talked to people who were there, and it wasn't the same. I wish fucking Hall would have been there, man. He would have just, you know, damn, you know. Hall, you know, Hall deserved to be there. And it was really, um, it was a legendary day for us all. I remember um, pulling up to the stadium in, in limos and the crowd with bat signs, you know, gypsy. I mean, it was almost like they were welcoming us more than the headliners. We were partying like rock stars, let's put it that way. Before we fucking played a note, people just stood there and went, ah, ah, banners came up. Gypsy, we love you. The crowd went wild. I think there was a lot of Gypsy fans went to that show. Uh, but one thing I remember most about that show was it was so hot that day. It was, it had to be at least 100 degrees. They had the whole infield and outfield covered with these canvas tarps. And the heat from the sun and everything else would just radiate uh, off of those tarps. And I was standing in, I guess it was around left field right behind second base. And it was like you're standing in a frying pan. It was unbelievable. Uh, from the time we got on the stage to the time we got off, it was, it was just the roar of the crowd. They, they love Gypsy in St. Louis. I was in as much a awe as the audience was. Yeah! All right! Thank you, St. Louis! And of course, now we know in hindsight, that was Rico's last show. So that day uh, had a lot more weight on it than we all you know, so it turned out to be a really special day in a lot of ways, in every way. We got back to Los Angeles. For some reason, nothing ever came of that. I, I kept wanting to, you know, to try and write some new songs, you know, and get it back going. But uh, all was in, or Walsh was in Minneapolis, and he was doing, started up a gypsy band here. And we were practicing here, we were writing new material and stuff, but it wasn't, it wasn't the same. <clears throat> it wasn't the same. So eventually after that, we kind of separated ways. And we were out there and just it, Rico became quite distant. I was at rehearsal. We were rehearsing in a warehouse over on the uh, West Bank, uh, getting ready to leave to go out on tour. And I got a call that he had taken his own life and just blew my mind, you know. Me and Jim were rehearsing and uh Obviously, it came as a shock. When we heard that, it was just like, wow, what? That's not, no, it can't be. Hold on a minute.
I had talked to Rico uh, about a month before that, a couple weeks before that. I ran into him at a party over south, and he was having some financial difficulties out there. And I told him, don't go back, man, really, don't go back. You know, I'm not going to get into details on any of it, but I just said, please don't go back. And he said, I got it, I got it, I got to go back. And um, next thing I knew, he was dead. It was the worst possible scenario, knowing very well that he had, uh, you know, crossed over and gotten into a very, very dark place. I certainly wish uh, uh, he were still around, and I wish uh, that we, uh, I wish I had a lot more time with him. For him to go out that way, and he had so much more to give in his writing and the talent, you know, he could have gone on for years. Rico is a genius. He's just the wrong people, right? Some kind of ruthless Pulp Fiction dudes, right? Serious. LA's a dangerous town, man. It's kind of odd that the last record had the, the angels and stuff on the cover, and after that he was gone. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was the power in Gypsy, no doubt about it. See, the songs that Gypsy played, man, these were songs. These brothers, man, taking your ass on some kind of journey when you put, drop the, that needle down. Y'all weren't ready for that, right? Rico wrote beautiful songs, and I had the pleasure of living with him when I first joined the band and, uh, and saw him write almost all the songs for the antithesis, and uh, he was a uh, special person, great lyricist and very good in uh, writing, writing chord changes and figuring out harmonies. Rico liked many other songwriters had a muse and uh, he would reach out and just think of these things they just come to him like you're pulling them out of the universe when rico sang you could really hear him pouring his heart out and his soul and guts so they died was a very charismatic guy, very, very magnetic kind of guy. And uh, uh, that came through in public performances. He was always positive in the message and always upbeat. And it was always real smooth. He'd work out the songs at home and then bring them to rehearsal and present it to the band. And we'd all come up with our parts. and. You know, the chemistry was right, and when the chemistry is right, it's not hard work. Rico was uh, something else. Those songs that he wrote, man. I've given a lot of thought to why Gypsy didn't become a national band, uh, nationally successful. And I think it did have a lot to do with uh, the lack of publicity for the band. You listen to that today and you still kind of wonder, why is it some other bands that 
re released debut albums at the time ended up having longer careers than, than Gypsy did because the material and the production and the performance is all just spot on on that first album. <laughs> They had all the right elements, but were missing one, at least one important thing, and that was the hit that would take them beyond the progressive rock format and take them to top 40 stations and expose them to others. But without that one uh, decent uh, hit for people to, to, to latch on to and to link, link it up with that band, uh, I then I, it just never really, it really it never really had that kind of uh, a national popularity, unfortunately. Gypsy was one of the original jam bands, really. That's what that band was. I mean, they were just way, way ahead of their time. I think that the the younger generation that's listening to uh, the jam bands today, uh, if they heard Gypsy, would be blown away by it. was deep. Every time, music was powerful and, uh, you know, you had to be in the game to play it, man. You had to, you had to really step up. You want to run with Gypsy, man, you better come, come with it, right? Maybe we didn't have uh, the big hit single, which would have put us over the top, although I felt we had some really good commercial songs, especially when we used the horn section from Chicago. Need You Baby and Turn It and some of those songs definitely sound classy and timeless to me. We spent about, about a month working with Columbia Records to get them uh, permission to do that with us and they finally did. Uh, we could use their names but we couldn't use the Chicago name in any way on it. So, But that was nice. That was very nice of them to do that. And that was a nice addition to that album. Well, that happened to a lot of bands. If you think about it, there were a lot of bands that didn't get the credit they deserved, or the, the fame that they should have gotten. You know, what makes a hit song and is a very tough question always. I can't believe that they didn't become huge stars if it's because the team wasn't there. And Gypsy, I don't know if it's because they didn't understand that at the time, or they didn't care, or they just didn't have the team together to pull that off but it didn't, it didn't diminish them in our minds at all. We were not aware that they weren't a hit on a national basis. Didn't, didn't really care. Gypsy was right in that category that almost famous, almost famous, and they just didn't quite make it. So, and I don't know why, I can't tell you why, it's just timing wasn't right, whatever. It just wasn't, didn't happen for us, and it should have. They had uh, the, the, uh, the musical talent there, but as Donnie Larson said to me, uh, I always thought of us kind of like the Allman Brothers. We had tragedy, we had difficulty, we had ups and downs, we had great times, we had bad times, but the Allman Brothers always figured out a way to stay together, and we didn't. written a song called Cause It's You Girl, sent it to Warren Schatz at RCA Records through a friend of mine there, and uh, he flipped out over the song. We went on and finished the album with the new band now, and we just started working like dogs. It was just a, a magical time for me. Great group of musicians, uh, high standard. We rehearsed a lot. We rehearsed almost every day. The biggest challenge was to not sound like Chicago or Blood, Sweat and Tears because they didn't want another Chicago. And so we tried real hard when we were doing arrangements. We'd come up with a line and we'd say, you know what, that's good but it sounds like Chicago or Blood, Sweat and Tears or Average White Band or you name it. And we wanted to kind of be in the tradition of Gypsy and that's always been a challenge putting horns into Gypsy is, is when to stay out of the way, you know, maybe do the flute part, but try not to stay in the guitar way. 
We stayed true to the lines. A lot of the lines were either string lines or organ lines. And we rehearsed and rehearsed and wrote a bunch of other material. A whole new way of living, of this love we Did the album here locally at a couple of studios. And uh, Warren Schatz, we would send him things and he would okay it or not okay it. But he was really basing everything on Cut It's You. And in 1979, we went out and toured again after the release of this album. Toured all over the East Coast and stuff. The creativity in the band, uh, the rhythm section would be on one side and they'd be working on a song and we were using little tape recorders at that time. And we'd have a tape from the band that they, they uh, recorded for us the day before, just with the rhythm section. And we'd be playing parts, Dion would play some jazz, and we'd say, well, we like that little bit. Let's incorporate that into it. It's those Alabama islands she right through me. As only love and eyes could ever do. And then I got an opportunity to work with Barry Beckett and Jimmy Johnson at Muscle Shoal Sound with the Swampers, which were probably top three of all time recording people. They've done everybody. Literally everybody, from the Rolling Stones to, you know, I guess I can't get much bigger name than that. So I went down there, I brought Bobby for vocals. Legendary studio in the middle of absolutely nowhere. There's nothing there, but the food in the, around the area is just wonderful. And we used the Muscle Shoals rhythm section, Tower of Power horns, Bee Gees strings. I was flying all over the country, and then they decided not to release that album. They shelved it, basically. I mean, that's, it was never really, it wasn't released. Broke my heart. But now in my heart I know. Now, it was a good time, and we had to, uh, you know, kind of re, uh, reconfigure everything again, you know. But we never gave up, we never stopped playing. When I look back at, at the career I had in music, I think it was, um, the most creative time. From those Alabama islands she right through me As only love and eyes could ever do And the fact that Owl is able to keep it going is a real testament to Owl. I think Gypsy was always still in the heart. You know, the music, again, like I say, it's ageless, and I've been playing it for years, and I'm not tired of it. We did it in the honor of the old album, so there's a lot of vocals a lot of different changes and stuff. It's been received very well. It brings together the old and the new, what's happening right now. Recording-wise, we don't sound like the old band. We didn't intend to. That's why the new CD has the name it does. Yesterday, today, tomorrow. With the uh, idea of creating something in the memory of what was created in 1970, so. We all collaborated and uh, it brought us together deeper, and uh, there's longevity in it. Goodbye to summer. Fall goes in with the chill of the breeze. Make it very goodbye to summer. We'll get it right. Hello to winter. A blanket of snow that will cover the leaves. One, two, hello to winter. Here we go. Changing. The changing of seasons. Now we're getting it. Hold beauty for all. To be able to do new tunes with the fellas and, and 
release our creative juices. We've been holding on and holding on. You know, the stage is really awesome with these guys, but uh, the studio, you're under the microscope. Um, it was a challenge, you know. Uh, James knows, knows how to inspire, though, and uh, it really um, was a great experience to uh, share that side of uh, James' thing as well. It wasn't a, a, a long thought out process. It was just kind of James is going, you know what, we're gonna do a, we're gonna do a record and uh, got together and banged it out. And uh, that's what kind of made it fun. It was um, not a lot of pre-thought. You know, that record was done in weeks as opposed to some people that might spend months or years doing an album. We put it together in a very short period of time. But uh, we had energy that we didn't think we had, you know, we made it, made it through and it was done before you knew it and it was a lot of fun. When we travel to go do our things, we talk about, well, let's do this, let's do this. And Just the camaraderie of being in the studio and hearing things come together, hearing things develop, ideas turning into uh, completed projects, uh, a, a lot of fun. Looking back at da, 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 da. That's the chorus. Let's go back to the top and we'll just move through the whole song. So, that part. Okay, let's go from top. All right. One more time there, Todd. I screwed that up. I want that right. I think a lot of the elements are still there from the old band. A, the vocals. B, I think, I'd like to think that we made it interesting enough where we've got some different feels within tunes. And yet some that are just straight ahead coming right at you. That was kind of our, uh, our goal all along, to keep that in mind. That's why we started with the big vocal piece and had some transition things like the first album did. I know when we go out to do the shows, our, our main thing is to really honor what the band is from the past up to now. So us doing this in its own way, you know, for the fan base, um, it's a little like stepping off a cliff because uh, it's an unknown. You don't know exactly how it's going to be accepted, but I think that uh, just taking a step back and looking at it, I think as Gypsy fans, I think they're going to like it a lot. But people want to hear the old stuff, which is, which is beautiful. They'll always hear that. But this new stuff, we're pretty excited about. The changing of seasons. St. Louis, uh, fans down there, it just, it just doesn't get any better. Well, St. Louis is probably our, our best town to play in. I mean, they, we have a lot of fans there. And I remember driving into town one, one uh, show, and uh, we happened to turn the radio on, and there was Gypsy Queen playing as we were coming by the arch in St. Louis. It was just uh, kind, of a neat, kind of a neat moment. Uh, you go there, and they know 
they know the music as well as we do. It's Wildy uh, brings out the best of the best of our fans who come from St. Louis and uh, it's an incredible time. We really appreciate going down there and playing there. Ladies and gentlemen, Gypsy!
Thank you.